I'm so curious. I want to know a little bit of the backstory. Like, when did you start the Guardian Angels? How did that come about? What year? I mean, I should have Googled all this before. No, no, no. It's quite all right. It's quite all right. Or you should Wikipedia because people are always changing my Wikipedia. Oh, God. You know, where I'm from, who I am. But 1979, I was a night manager of Mickey D's up in the Bronx. Rough place. The Bronx was burning down. A million people had fled New York City. It was in worse shape than it is now. It's bad now, but it was worse back then. Abandoned buildings, arson, gangbangers running around with cut-off lead jackets. They had the rockets of the name of the gangs on their back. And they dominated the city. And we were on the brink of a fiscal collapse, almost going bankrupt because of the corruption. You know, so many of our Hazarai politicians, the pigs that they are, putting their beak in the trough, siphoning off tax dollars and enriching through patronage uh, their buddies. And we were on the brink of collapse. We had no transit police at night. They had removed all the transit police. So I said, hey, you know something? I got to close this restaurant. I'll get my closing crew. I'll conscript them. Basically have uh, Ray Kroc pay for the additional time that we were (laughs) patrolling the trains. And we started as the Burger Boys on the number four train, the Muggers Express. Was that the worst train? uh, It was at that time. The number four train, the Muggers Express. A lot of folks listening now know, oh, yeah, yeah, I go to Yankee Stadium. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, you should go a little further north in Yankee Stadium and you'd have an X-Lax attack. You'd have to be wearing Depends. But anyway, the point is we started patrolling that and it started getting better. Whereas the, the rest of the subway system was getting worse. Ed Koch was the mayor at that time. Thank God it was not social networking because he was master of the 30-second soundbite. He called us vigilantes, hell's angels, a gang. And this was a time where vigilante movies were the hit on the deuce, 42nd Street. Charles Bronson in Death Wish, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Buford Pusser in Walking Tall. De Niro in Taxi Driver, you know, mm, that psycho, yeah. psycho boy. So they all say, oh, yeah, yeah, he's like Travis Bickle, Sliwa, you know, he's out of his mind. I was a little bit on the edge. I mean, I could really deuce you up at that time. And you had to because we didn't carry weapons. And I enforced that amongst the guardian angels. Could you if you wanted to? No. I don't believe in weapons. Okay. So people say, oh, he's a tough guy. Yeah, but tough guys don't need to carry weapons. If you want to get young men, because it's young men creating most of the problems, to have low levels of testosterone, thinking that phallic symbol that they carry around the gun is the key to manhood. You got to be out there as a peacemaker. You can't be out there carrying guns too. Now, cops, they need guns. But if you're going to be a volunteer and a peacemaker and you're trying to guide them to become protectors instead of predators, which I've done with a lot of guardian angels, you got to be a role model and example. Uh, I don't like guns. I understand there's a need for them. But I know the danger that guns bring, especially to a city where people never grew up with guns. They don't know how to manage a gun, handle a gun. It's like a Pandora's box. And they use it just by having shootouts constantly. And normally, they can't even shoot straight. They always end up shooting innocent victims instead of their intended victims. Right, because there's how many? There's no shooting regions up here. <laughs> well, not only that, but let's face it, there's a mystique about guns. You grow up in the rural areas of the country, there are guns throughout the house because... God forbid you had a home invasion. You're going to call the sheriff. You're going to call uh, Andy Griffin and Mayberry RFD. Are you kidding? It would take them a month of Sundays to right. get there. You got to deal with it yourself. But in our country, it's got to be one rule for everyone. No. should be different rules in an urban area, suburban area, and rural area because we have to understand people live different kinds of lives and have different kinds of needs. So it was through being a guardian angel you learned how to talk to people and kind of, you know, dissolve tension and maybe break up fights or were people intimidated by you? I mean, how many of of you guys were there? Uh, At one time in New York City alone, there were a thousand. uh, We're in 13 uh, countries now, 130 cities. So we're global. Uh, But sure, we can be intimidating when we have to be. But the idea is that you, you, you don't use brutal force. You don't beat people up. Uh, If you have to arrest somebody or detain somebody, you do it in a way in which you're not ganging up on the person. You're not putting boots to the back of their head. You're showing people in the immediate area you're there as a peacemaker, not as a troublemaker. But sometimes you have to use force. You have. Look, if somebody pulls out a knife and wants to slice you up like sushi, you got no no choice. But you got to take him down and he's got to be sucking concrete with a little pain compliance to understand that he's crossed the line. Yeah, I was getting so mad over the lockdowns, like more so last year, just to see people getting attacked, uh, like 
oftentimes it was an Asian person getting attacked on the subway. And I'd be like, I would be watching these videos and I'm like, three dudes could break this apart. Three dudes could take this one guy down and nobody was doing anything. Everybody just had their phones out, they're recording. And I'm like, why is nobody trying to break any of this up? You well, know? because people have been told, oh, you don't want to get involved. You could be arrested. You could be sued. Because remember, for every one human being, there are 10 lawyers. And they're out there and they're practicing their martial art every day. <laughs> I sue. And they have sued people who have been good Samaritans. So everybody hears of those horror stories. And it's drummed into you. Don't take a chance. Nobody's going to care about you. Whereas I believe in the reverse. If you have it within your means, you have to physically intervene. Now, if it's not within your ability or means, you got to do something. You can't just be prostate. You can't just sit idly by. And nowadays, because everybody has a cell phone, they figure, okay, at least I'm filming it, which is good because at least we know who the person is. But nowadays, how many times are these people even caught? And by the way, they start waving at the camera like, yo, man, yo, it's going to be on 6 o'clock news, yeah. Yeah, is that an iPhone 12? That's right, <laughs> I'm going to be international, this is going to make me famous. Yeah, it does, infamous, but there's very few repercussions and there are very few consequences for your actions nowadays. But sure, if, you, if all you could do is film the, the person or take a photograph of the person, that helps. But not to the point where, hey, I got to upload it, man. Look, look, look how many hits I got. You know, say, yo, there's a reason you're taking the film. There's a reason you're taking the photo. It's not just to be for likes. It's for likes. An influencer. (laughs) You know, you're going to be the the next person who's doing uh, uh, America's Most Wanted, right? You're you're auditioning for that. So, how did the berets start? How did you pick red? How did you get everybody, like, how did you get everybody an outfit? I don't know. Maybe this is just like. My well, female concern. Yeah, well, back then, uh, and please never call it a um, a tam. Uh, okay. Please never call it. What a is tam. a tam? A tam. That's like uh, with a little beanie on top. Okay. You know, that's a tam, and don't call it a kango because you know there a kango looks a little bit like this. This is an old fashioned Boy Scout beret. All I did was take the patches off, and because it came in plentiful supply in different sizes, I was able to get it from an Army Navy store. It was just because you could see it at a great distance, and the subways back then were very dark and dank, so they would knock out all the old GE light bulbs. It's not like you have now fluorescent light. Wow. It was yeah. GE light bulbs, and that was uh, so that it would become a mugger's delight. Hmm. And people would run to the Red Beret. That's how you know it's a guardian angel. You look at the cops now. They're styling and profiling. They never wear their caps. I look at the cops and say, hey, put your freaking cap on. How the hell would I know that you're a cop at the other end of the platform? Yeah, it's hard to tell. They're just and wearing they're, they're dark. They're always on their cell phones, yeah. their iPhones, sexting, because we know they're not texting <laughs> back to the precinct. Sexy. Oh, headquarters. This, what, his microphone is running hey. away from me. But you notice the cops, they always have their heads buried in their iPhones, smartphones, and I say to him, oh, the precinct is alerting you? Come on. Oh. What, are, what are you, updating your, your profile Will here? you say that Do to you, them? Do you talk to the cops? Oh, hell yeah. They know me. They know me. I'm in their face sometimes, especially the rookies, because they, they really don't know who I am. The old timers know, hey, watch, Slee was around. But the rookies, they say, how's it your business? I say, it's my tax dollar. What the hell are you doing on your smartphone, iPhone? I know you're not communicating with Central Command here. I it's know like you're if, updating your social it's network like if you profile. you saw your coworker, your boss, somebody who worked at, at your job, if they were always on their phone, you would say something. Yeah, I would think they were Anthony Weiner. <laughs> you know, the former congressman who was always sexting and texting. Oh, yeah. You know, he was my radio partner, too, for a while. Wow. Yeah, they, I took a chance. The management said, come on, you can't have Anthony. Well, that's a kid of many. He's a good talk show host. See, he had a lot of opinions. Yeah. But in between breaks, the guy could not put his cell phone down. Now we know what he was doing. Right. So they asked me, how was? I'd say, he's a good talk show host. He'd be a good partner. But, man, there's something going on on his iPhone, his smartphone. He can't put it down. He's like, what's the Wi-Fi password? i got to send these dick pics off. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but, no, the guy was a very good talk show host. He just hey, yeah, had that uh, weak spot. Weak yeah. Spot. We all, you know, we all have our... Hidden demons. Achilles heels. That's right. Hidden demons. So you decided to go for the red. You went with the hat because it was plentiful. You could, would you, how would it work? Would somebody be like, hey, would you recruit people or would you, would people come to you? No, no. We recruit join? specifically uh, guys and gals who looked like they were on the cusp of getting into trouble or had been in trouble. We'd have referrals, mothers coming to us. Hey, I got a son or daughter here. They're out of control. 
Uh, although there were some mothers who were trying to string me up from the nearest telephone pole. How dare you? Uh, my daughter, my son, my precious little baby, you're going to get him killed. I said, ma'am, believe it or not, they're safer being a guardian angel than just hanging out, minding their own business and getting swept up into trouble. Uh, and the reason for the red, and this is the number one reason, my last name is Shliva. It's Polish. Some think it's Ukrainian. It's Russian. It means plum. I was the Grand Marshal of the Pulaski Day Parade, right? Nobody knows about it. Fifth Avenue, one so of the biggest So you know parades. how many light bulbs, it, how many people oh, it takes to go, screw right? in a light bulb. God well, damn it. I've, this is the funny one, though. <laughs> I'm coming out of St. Patrick's Cathedral. I did not get struck by lightning. I got the tucks and the tails on in my red beret, and this tourist bus pulls up from San Diego, and I have guardian angels there. Curtis, Curtis, we didn't know that the Polish people have a parade honoring Roman Polanski. I said, that Uh-oh. pedophile on a pedestal? I said, <laughs> no. no, no, it's it's Pulaski. Oh, God. It's Kosciuszko, not Kosciuszko. Kosciuszko, not the mustard, not the bridge. They had no idea. So... Having grown up, part of me, Polish-American, on my father's side, he would take me to the annual Pulaski Day Parade, and I would see the red and white flag in the distance. And you could spot that, like, miles away. I said, that's a good combination, the red and the white. So believe it or not, that's how I came up with the color combination. I know from a fashionista point of view, it's not going to sort of tickle your fashion, uh, your fashion creativity, but it, it came about from, believe it or not, the annual Pulaski Day Parade that I saw as a youngster. I like it. It looks sharp. I mean, I personally look better in jewel tones, like blues, greens, but I, I like it. I like the red. It makes sense. It's, you see it right away. It's, 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 it's in your face. Right? Yeah. And I didn't know that you were recruiting kind of, you know, guys and gals that were maybe about to get into trouble themselves or about to, Guys, you know. gals, gays and lesbians. Back then, that was, you, you didn't do that. Transgenders, it didn't matter. You want to make a difference, hey, you're welcome in. Although it could be very rough for them because society was not as open-minded. I don't know if you know this. I performed a gay wedding in the South Bronx, 1976. Wow. In the projects. And I love it. You know, people say, he's the homophobe. I say, Why do people think that? Well, they just assume it because, you know, they have stereotypes about everything in life. They want to they wanna sort of box you into yeah. a stereotype. I had a closer named Ralphie, great crew member. And guys would come in from gangs, the Savage Skull, Savage Nomads, and they'd be in, in Spanish cursing them out. Puñeta, Chota Puñeta, you know, Maricón, all these, what, hey, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll knock your, your nose right down your throat. I didn't tolerate any of that. People say, whoa, what's wrong with you? You know, that was back in the 70s. This was the thing to do. And one day, Ralphie comes up to me. Say, hey, I'm getting married to my, uh, my friend, Vinny. Would you say a few words at our ceremony? I said, where is it? The Soundview Projects. I said, that's Black Spade territory. Yeah. I said, yeah, yeah, I'm coming. Because I don't think they're going to tolerate this. Was that a gang? Hell Yeah. Bad gay. <laughs> and they were not, uh, let's say they were not open minded to gay or lesbian weddings. They were not woke. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and at that time, I was a, a disco duck. I used to love to go to after hours clubs. So you'd run across all kinds of people gays, lesbians, straights. It didn't matter. People would love to club into the wee hours in the morning. So I performed the ceremony. Uh, my fellow assistant manager, Don Chin, was there, had been a former member of the Savage Skulls. And the Black Spades were outside. And I went outside with Donna. I said, hey, why don't you just watch and see how this is like normal. These are regular people. Stop making fun of them. Believe it or not, they actually listened. They didn't make a lot of noise out. I think they were stunned. Yeah. And then I ended up doing the robot dancing to the wee hours of the morning. Because, oh, man, I was like soul trained Don Cornelius. Wow. I could do the robot better than any white boy in America. <laughs> Now, see, people don't know that about me, right? Now they do. And that's what I love. Democrats, liberals, oh, he's a homophobe. He's a racist. He's a sexist. He's a misogynist. I said, where do you get this stuff from? You know, people are people. Judge them for who they are. Yeah, I happen to be a Republican. I happen to be an independent candidate for mayor. But I can go into neighborhoods, again, where the only Republican they've ever seen is Abraham Lincoln on a $5 bill. And I get respect. I get street cred because I've delved into all these areas. And all these labels they want to put on you, 
Doesn't fit Curtis Lewa. Yeah, it's just it's so easy to label people, and that's what they do. They discredit you as a person so that nobody can listen to the points you're making and uh, the policies you want to bring in and the good that you are going to do the city.